So um, in our song here from Westminster Shorter Catechism 61, what is forbidden in the fourth commandment, it, it uh, says one of the things that is uh, forbidden, and that this is the question that has been asked, uh, what does it mean by profaning the day by, by idleness? So when you think about, when you think about Sabbath, um, and I, I did a, a I, if you've been around me a while, you know I spent about five years thinking about Sabbath and how you apply Sabbath, what the scripture says about Sabbath, um, and, and then trying to see if that works in, in real life. Um, and, um, and then fi finally did kind of cap it off. I, I did a search on every time the Bible mentions the word Sabbath and studying all those, all those passages. And so what you see when you look at all the passages that, where God speaks on, on Sabbath um, is uh, there are um, two two main aspects of Sabbath. Um, any guesses as to what, what might be included in, in Sabbath or things that you, you've seen in, in Scripture? Worship. Okay, worship. Yeah, good. That's, that's the less common one, actually. Um, but that's very much a center. And so you have a set, you'll see the phrase in Scripture, a Sabbath unto the Lord. It's a day that's directed at the Lord. Um, and so a Sabbath, the Sabbath day is set apart for God's people to come together and worship. And so you see that in Scripture. Um, and so that's um, very much, I'm very pleased you got that. Um, so you have, uh, you have this, we could call it the second, we could call it the first. Uh, aspect of it, uh, of worship, and that it's a day that is unto the Lord. Um, it's a day um, set apart, and and it's a day set apart um, so that God's people might worship Him. Okay. What's the, what's another aspect of, of Sabbath? Rest. Okay, yeah. And so the other aspect is is rest. And again, this is not a, a priority, although you can see why part of part of resting is so we can do what that we've already mentioned. Worship. Yeah. Uh, so God says, "Here's the deal. I set a pattern for you." I worked for six days in creation, and then I rested on the seventh, seventh day, and I called it holy, or what's holy mean? Set, set apart. Set apart. Mm -hmm. So I set apart out of your seven-day week, I set apart one day. Now, the writer of Hebrews, you know, talks about God didn't have to rest. God doesn't get exhausted. He does not get tired, you know, Isaiah 40, he's not, you know, he does not get weary or faint, um, but the Lord does that as an example for us to set a pattern for us so that when we're godly and like him so godly like him we work seven days and then on the seven or six days and then on the seventh day we rest uh and so jesus this is part of jesus argument uh that god didn't make man for the sabbath but made the sabbath for man um that is we need to have a day of rest. And so God makes the Sabbath day, and commands the Sabbath day, so that we have a day of rest because we need it. We need a day of rest. Um, and so God makes the Sabbath for, for man, for our rest. Um, and so rest has kind of uh, two, two, two functions here um one you've named we we rest so that we can worship so there's a, a connection here we've got a day set apart so um you know we're not we're not sitting in church saying man i gotta go someplace i got a lot to do today when's this gonna end right it's like where are you going what else are you doing today you know god calls us to to, to sabbath and that's that's not an excuse for us having a four-hour service but um it's just that that's our mentality. The whole day is is set apart for God. It's God's, it's what else do we call besides the Sabbath? 
Lord's day. The Lord's day. In other words, hear this, not your day. Okay. It's the Lord's day, and that's all the, the godly focus of the Sabbath day. So we rest so we can worship. But like Jesus said, God also makes the Sabbath for us, um, and, and we get this other aspect of, of rest. Uh, and Yes, good, Bob. Um, related to this is restoration. Why do we rest? To be restored. And we're restored by resting we're re and, and, and worshiping. We're restored physically, uh, psychologically, uh, socially, uh, emotionally, by the day. And so God creates this day for us that we would be restored so that we're refreshed going into the work day and we work because we love our neighbor. Our work is unto love of neighbor. We do stuff for other people. Um, that's what our work is about. Um, and so when we talk about um, profaning the day by idleness, what's up here that's not idle? Worship. worship, yeah. Uh, Book of Acts calls, uh, you know, talks about the, the work of worship that we do. Uh, but note here in worship, how does that relate to this stuff? How is it a, 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 a not a, a vicious cycle, but a, a cycle? How does it interact? Is it historical? Yeah, Bill. Uh, the restoration is spiritual. Yeah. Because when we get spiritual food. That's right. On Sunday. Great. Exactly. Um, so we rest so we can worship, and the worship restores us. Okay? So it's a you know it's it's, it's a cycle there. We rest so we can worship, we worship so we can get restored. Um, but again, the the, um, the focus in this is is the Lord there. But as we turn our attention to him, as we praise him, as we uh, reserve our thoughts for him and not our worldly employments and not a soccer game or whatever, as I reserve my thoughts to him, um, I'm restored uh, in, in the day. And so, um, yeah, Bill. Psalm 23, he restores my soul. Yeah, yeah. He restores our soul. That's what the Lord does. Um, and how does he restore our soul by, by our, our resting and focusing upon him? So you have these two aspects, rest and focus on the Lord. Um, and um, so profaning the day by idleness means we're not just lying in bed all day and not going to worship with God's people. So it's not Sunday fun day? It's not Sunday fun day. <laughs> yeah, and so... This is, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to Matthew. Um, so um, sometimes people look at Sabbath day and what you can do and not do kind of as two lists. And it's okay to have kind of a, a, a general list for yourself. You know, uh, and, but what you really want to understand are these principles. And you want to ask, so I love running. I never run on Sunday. I don't lift weights on Sunday. I love doing it. But the question in Sabbath is not, what do you like doing? It's never in Sabbath. It's not, so sometimes people say, oh, but I like doing this. So I'll do this on the Sabbath. That's not the question. And that's never where God gears us. I love football, but where's, the, where's my head? <clears throat> okay, so I watch college football. I watch Monday night if I get a chance, or Saturday night when the playoffs come on. I'm like, yeah, I get to watch an NFL football game. But but it, it, it's this. I reserve my my thoughts, my heart, as much as I'm able to. And we never do this perfectly, you know. And and you know, we'll get our thought into our worldly employments, or or we'll think about you know our recreations or or something else. Um, but. But we don't lower the standard. We're always we're always looking at this standard um, in our lives. And why don't I run on Sunday? Because running, by definition, breaks down my muscles, tears muscle fibers, so that they build up stronger, which is what weightlifting does as well. 
Um, and, and so that's not a restorative process. Restoration then has to happen because I've been out running. Okay. All right. And so interestingly, as I did marathon training and did some, got some online coaching for that, they say, if you do not take a day of full rest, and these weren't believers, if you do not take this where the science is on, on running, if you do not take a full day of rest, you will get injured. Um, and, and, your, and your running times will get slower. Your body just, and they've discovered that scientifically, your body needs, you know, and, and when competitive athletics, um, a, a full day of rest. Um, so, God yeah. That's what he's talking about. He does, lo and behold. Um, so, um, yeah, so um, you can kind of have tentative lists here, uh, but you always want to run through each activity that comes up and say, is this, Will this enable me to continue some kind of focus upon the Lord? Or will it completely take my mind somewhere else? Um, will this be, will this activity be like kind of what I'm doing all week long? Um, or will it help restore me so I can, so that I can do the work from the rest of the week um, uh, better uh, when I, when I get back to it? And so you want to ask these principles is, will this restore me or break me down? And does this get in the way of worship in my focus of the Lord? Or does it aid me? Or at least is it neutral for me? And so I, I do that literally. I do this with everything that comes up before me or for my family. I say, um, how, how, how's that, is this going to take my focus away from the Lord? Or is this going to... Um, break me down or make me tired. If I arrive Monday morning tired, I've not observed the Sabbath well. Because the Sabbath is to restore me so I wake up Monday and I'm ready to go. Um, and then I, I get to Saturday night and I'm like, man, that was a tough week. And Sunday I can, by Sunday I can rest. Yeah. So good, good question, Emily. Any other uh, thoughts or questions about that? And we can talk more about later. We'll probably do this song next week too, as we're trying to learn it. Like the age of living now, they want to take recreations out of the book. Right? Yeah, and we lost families to the, that recreations one there, because you know it's like for uh, for us who are old, we know there were no sports on Sundays that you could play, like no little league, no soccer games, no softball, no baseball, no. I mean, it's just. It was just sacred, sacred ground. And now, you know, they convince kids, if you keep paying us, or they convince the parents, if you keep paying us loads of money, I just read yesterday from a friend, and he had gone in debt because his kids were in competitive soccer. And they were living beyond their means so their kids could be in competitive soccer. Um, but, but they tell you, you know, if you stay in our program, you'll get a college scholarship. Yeah, <laughs> right. You'll be one, you know, and it's just, it, it's, but, um, but yeah, that, that um, uh, takes people out on, on Sundays, um, and, and then, and, and then their hearts, you know, kind of start straying a little bit, and then eventually they're, they're out of the church, and so, um, something to heed, and something very countercultural um, for us today. Didn't used to be countercultural. Um, you know, if you're around in the 50s and 60s, you couldn't go to a store, really, uh, or you couldn't play a, a competitive sport on, on Sunday. And now, it's, you might, you know, it's just weird, you know, if you, if you, if you don't. Okay, good. Um, all right, Deuteronomy, um, your, uh, your pre-quiz there. But with Sabbath, keep in mind, you know, Jesus said this is a gift to you. And, and that's, that's the way you want to think about Sabbath. Um, God rebukes his people for specifically for saying, when will the Sabbath be over so that I can work again? Um, and, and, and so Isaiah, Nehemiah are places to look for that. Um, and and uh, he has... Uh, People go out and, and shut the city gates so that, so that foreign traders can't come in and sell their stuff in Jerusalem. And so the people in Jerusalem can't go out and sell their stuff on the day. He, he, God shuts it down um, so they don't do that. Um, so they can spend the day resting and, and, uh, 
uh, worshiping him. Okay. Um, That's really nice. What's that? That sounds really nice. Which is, yeah, which is nice. And so think about that. This is, it's a weekly vacation from all the stuff that you would have to do the rest of the week. Um, okay, so first question uh, there. Um, someone at Matthew, did you have a question? I, didn't, I know I didn't get back to you. Okay, well, I can do it offline. Okay, all right. Um, first question we have for us, uh, Betsy, can you read that for us? Question one. <coughs> On your green sheets. The book of Deuteronomy contains how many addresses, sermons of Moses? Okay, um, what's our answer there? Three, yeah. So you can see it here. Oh, I'm giving the answer away. So I'll just put that up there. Um, uh, we looked at this uh, last week. I'll get this back up for you. So here's our outline of Deuteronomy. There's a preamble, a historical review of um, Egypt to edge of the promised land. Uh, then uh, the end of four, really the beginning of five, uh, starts the stipulations of the covenant. That is a repetition of the law. Um, chapter 27, uh, covenant blessings, cursings, and ratification, and 31, one succession. Uh, but Moses' first address is contained in, in this uh, these first four chapters in the preamble and the historical review. And then uh, his second address, and you can see these markers at the beginning of these outline points. You know, then Moses said this, and there's some kind of introduction, and then Moses starts talking. Um, and then his uh, third address is there at 20, 27 through through 30. Um, there. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, Mallory, can you read it for us? Moses writes Deuteronomy 2. So it's called the first question. Okay, let's read all of these. Uh, Andrew, what's our first option? He convinced the Israelites not to return to Egypt, but to enter into the promised land. Okay, Allison, next one. Convince the Israelites to follow Moses' covenant order for the nation. Uh, Matt? Convince the Israelites their future blessing depends upon compliance with the regulation of holiness given at Sinai. Teresa? Call the second generation of Israelites to arms and to hold an armor of God. Okay, and then our last option is what? Um, Emily? Guide Israel in covenant renewal under Joshua. Okay. Um, you know, want to take a stab at the answer there? E. Yeah, E. Um, what's A? That's our purpose statement for Genesis. What's B? That's our purpose statement for Exodus. Uh, what's C? We're going to guess Leviticus. That's our purpose statement for Leviticus, keyword regulations in there. What's D? Numbers. Numbers, there you go. Those are our, our, our purpose statements for the books of books of Moses. There, um, why he's writing each of, each of those each of those books there. But uh, when we get to Deuteronomy, he's guiding Israel um, to uh, continue to follow the covenant under under Joshua. All right, uh, number three, um, Bill, would you read that question for us? Circle all that are given in Deuteronomy. Okay, um, Jeff, can you read A? summary of Israel's history from Egypt to the age of the promised land. Okay, is that in Deuteronomy? It is, yeah, that's that historical section uh, starting in, in uh, 1.5. Uh, how about uh, B, Ashley? A repetition of the law by those who are outside of Okay, is that in Deuteronomy? It is, yeah. So we see that up in, in 444, you know, in chapter, roughly chapter 5 onward, the a repetition of the law, uh, the stipulations. Um, uh, C, uh, Blake. Yeah, is that in Deuteronomy? Yeah. It is. So there, chapter chapter 28 is where it is in Deuteronomy. Um, and then, uh, let's see, Chase, can you read uh, D for us? Or, yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. How about that? That was the trickiest one in here. The, there is that in there. And we hadn't talked about that last week, so give yourself a free pass on that one. But he tells them, what's he tell them about how they're to fight the, the war? No mercy. Yeah. Uh, wipe out everything. 
Okay, it's and the language God uses in Deuteronomy is like uh, wipe it out like a whole burnt offering, the whole thing wiped out as an offering, as an act of worship unto me. Um, why would you do that to a people? How would that be like a, a burnt offering? What's on the burnt offering when you sin? sin? sin. Um, and, and so in uh, Genesis 15, God tells Abraham, I'm going to give you the land, but not now, because they have not reached the fullness of their sin. But when they do, I'll send your descendants in and I will wipe them out. I'll wipe them off the face of the earth uh, because their sin had become so great. So don't think these are innocent people or nice, you know, kind people and God, the meanie comes in. These were people who were doing the worst kinds of things on the face of the earth. And God clears them off the earth. It's like the, the criminal who keeps ruining families' lives, who keeps getting out of jail and ruining more families' lives. And you say, they just, we just need to get, we just need to give this guy the death penalty. Everywhere, everyone he touches, he ruins their life. Okay. And so uh, God gives this command, we call it the, the Joshua Mandate, where uh, all is wiped out in the promised land because this land is to be holy, set apart to me. And if you leave them there, the, anyone of them in the land, what will happen to you, Israelites? Yeah, you'll get sucked in by them, do the same, worship their gods. And so don't leave them alive or you'll be ensnared by them. So th those are the warfare directions um, that we see there. Yeah, Matthew. With respect to the whole burnt office offering aspect, it's punitive in nature for the current residents and not substitutionary in any way, correct? Um, yes, in, in terms of this warfare, yeah. Okay, so like, when they're wiped out, there is, it has nothing to do with the, the atonement of the Israelites. Yeah. Correct. Okay. It does not. Um, similar to final judgment. It's, it's a pre-showing of final judgment in which um, the uh, the wicked receive what it's due them. Yeah. So it's just God exacting justice through the Israelites. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, God, the Israelites are his instrument um, to wipe out their sin from the earth. And, and it is a precursor to a foreshadowing of final judgment in, in which uh, all with final judgment, what you have is over the whole earth, wicked people will be wiped out, wiped from the face of the earth, and God's people will be given the promised land to be blessed. Okay, except at, at, at final judgment, what's the promised land that the that God's people are given? New heavens and new earth, the whole earth. Matthew 5 5, the meek, us, shall inherit what? The earth. The earth. That's a literal promise. Yeah, Bill. It's also not just to look forward to final judgment, I'm going to look back to Noah and the flood. Same thing. Yeah, saying you guys in Canaan yeah. haven't learned from the past. Right. So God's consistent from mm -hmm. yeah. Genesis to Revelation. You see the judgment of the guilty. Yeah. It's, you see the consistency of God, the consistency of his character. And you see how in Scripture we call this biblical theology, where God, God, we did it in our Acorn to Oak Tree series. You see these repeated themes over and over again in Scripture. And so Noah, what's God doing? He's wiping sin from the face of the earth and giving the earth to the righteous, Noah and his family. Promised land, same thing. He's wiping the uh, evil from the face of the land. You know, in Hebrew, the word for land and earth is the same word, arets. And so English interpreters and all interpreters have to decide, is this a reference to the promised land or is this a reference to the whole earth? Because it's just, it's the same word. And so you have to look at context and see which is being talked about. But um, but with, with this, you have a redoing of the Noahic, fun word, Noahic flood, um, because except it's limited in scope. God is wiping out, he's punishing the wicked and wiping them from the face of the land and giving the land instead to his people to bless them. And then we'll see that again uh, with final final judgment. Um, where, uh, the the um, wicked are removed from the earth they appear before the throne of Jesus. He judges them, casts them into the lake of fire. And then he says, behold, I'm making everything new. 
and he, he recreates the earth and gives it to his people, which is what we see at the, in Revelation 21 and 20, 21 and 22. Okay, good. Um, all right, uh, E, um, let's see, uh, Lily. Yeah, do we see that in Deuteronomy? We do. Yeah, it's a big part of the end of the book. And then F, uh, Joyce. Moses' death. Yes. Uh, do we see Moses' death in Deuteronomy? Yeah. Yep, that's where we see it. Okay, good. Um, Laura, would you read number four for us? Okay. Um, Brandy, can you read A? Uh, Joshua wrote the book, but most of the book is the crooked addresses of Moses to the Israelites at Mount Nebo. Okay. As we, we talked about this last week, is that an acceptable view among you know, Bible-believing people? Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah, so it's one possibility that Joshua wrote this book or somebody else under inspiration of the Holy Spirit who was around at that time. Uh, we just think Joshua is the most likely candidate. But there's nothing in Scripture that says this, um, although Joshua does record some stuff of Moses at certain times, we see. Um, uh, but um, that what, he, what Joshua writes, 90% of the words are directly the words of Moses, you know, or, or the words of Moses in these three addresses. Um, so it's like, you know, I give three sermons three weeks in a row, and you record these sermons week for week, and then you write, this is what he said on April 4th. And then uh, in front of the second sermon, you say, this is what he said on April 11th. And on front of the third sermon, you said, this is what he said on April 18th. And then at the end, you said, we, and then we killed him. <laughs> <laughs> and then you publish the book, uh, right? You know, that book is going to be your book, but it's going to be, Primarily my, my words, which brings us uh, to Sydney. Can you read C or B, B for us? Primary mosaic authorship. Very good. Um, primary mosaic authorship. So is that okay? And then we'll talk about what that is. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, what would we say primary, primary mosaic authorship would be? Primarily Moses wrote it. Primarily Moses wrote it. So it's really, it's what we call A. A is just the definition of B. So Bible-believing, evangelical scholars, pastors, we talk about uh, Deuteronomy being primary, primary mosaic authorship. And what we mean is that most of the words came right out of Moses' mouth. And, uh, uh, yeah, so that's primary uh, mosaic authorship. On to uh, C, Jim. Moses wrote all the books. Okay, is that an acceptable view? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's possible Moses wrote the whole book, mm -hmm. delivered it to the people, and then Joshua or someone else wrote the Moses death account and brought that on under inspiration of the Holy Spirit and put that together with Deuteronomy under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and that was God's intent to have one book with two authors, Moses doing the, the, everything up until his death, and then Joshua or someone else finishing it off. So that's an acceptable view. And then um, D, Christina. Deuteronomy was written by priests during the divided monarchy and during the Babylonian exile. Okay, is that something we, yeah, you're shaking your heads now. Yeah, and so this is uh, liberal scholars, critical scholars who don't think the Bible is inspired by God typically go here. Uh, and so uh, during the days of Josiah, Josiah reigned, he was a, a king in Judah from 640 to 609. And uh Josiah is the father of the kings who get exiled. Um, and, uh, uh, and uh, in the case, a, a grandfather of, of one. Um, so right there at the end. But Josiah, when he brings the, the nation back from its wickedness, he says, hey, priests and Levites, go clean out the temple which has been shut down. Clean it up and get it functioning. We need to be worshiping the Lord. And in the midst of cleaning up the temple, they find the book of the law and they read it and they go, uh-oh, because they read the blessings and curses. And they say, these curses we're experiencing, God has directed these because we haven't been obeying the law of Moses. 
And so they, they, with trepidation, they bring it to Josiah and they say, we found this. And, and Josiah has it read to him and, and Josiah tears his robe and, and basically does the king of Nineveh thing, calls for repentance and, and, and cries out to the Lord and, and brings great restoration uh, to, the, to the nation and faithfulness back to the nation. And so um, they, um, critical scholars who don't believe the Bible's telling the truth, uh, in most cases, they're inconsistent in this, but they say the priests and the Levites, they wrote up this book at that time to justify um, their own vocations so that the temple would regain prominence because that was their job, right, to work in the temple. And so they wrote this and they claimed that Moses wrote it so that the people would say, oh, Moses wrote this, we should follow it, even though Moses really hadn't. And so that's the critical viewpoint and um, some critical uh, 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 and non-Bible believing uh, people say also that there are additions to this that were created during the exile by priests who were off in Babylon. Okay. Um, but the first three are, are what, we, what we look at with Deuteronomy. Okay. Um, any questions about that before we uh, go on? Okay. Okay. Um, so well, we're talking now about how the content uh, serves the purpose of the book. So you see your purpose of, of the book uh, there in number two, E, guide Israel and covenant renewal under Joshua. Um, all these elements in this book are toward that purpose, to guide Israel and covenant renewal under Joshua. So they, they get back in touch. They renew themselves to the covenant. Um, they say, yes, we will do this. Um, and leadership is transitioned over to Joshua in the midst of that. So that they go into the promised land, obeying the law of Moses, um, uh, not only the, the, the moral law, but the ceremonial law. They've got the judicial law there for when they settle in the land, how to run things, stop signs and so forth. Um, and then the uh, instructions about how to do warfare. When you, you know, when you attack a city, don't, don't, take the, don't take the pretty women and make them your wives, God says. Uh, but you must destroy them all or there'll be snares to you. And then you'll worship other gods. Then I'll have to give you the covenant curses. And I don't want to do that. Um, so this is what's going on in the book. And so we, we can talk about how the uh, content uh, serves the, the purpose. Um, what's in the preamble? What's, what's uh, Moses say there, or Joshua, whoever's writing at that point? You can look if you want to, just the first, like, four verses. Is it like confirmation that this is Moses speaking from God? Yeah. So you have confirmation. You have the setup. The preamble is, you know, I'll just read it here. These are the words Moses spoke to all Israel in the desert east of the Jordan. Okay, so that's the, the setup. It's the, the, the context, the setting. Um, and so God's people can know, as they're about to go under uh, Joshua, Moses, these are the things Moses said to us and established as, as true for us and things that we need to, we need to follow. Um, so that serves, serves their purpose. It establishes the authority of what's in Deuteronomy because the one who um, led us out of Egypt is the one who gave us these laws and commands and directives, and so we should follow it. Um, next, how would the re historical review serve this purpose of covenant renewal under Joshua? Yeah, a lot of it is negative examples. Um, and so it's, it's a reminder of what not to follow and what was the original intent, um, why they wandered for 40 years. So there's a, there's a recounting of the 12 spies in, that, in this section here. But just, just, a brief, just a brief thing. So this, uh, this gears them up. It reminds them they've read, they've read numbers. Um, and, and that's you know, the big lesson there about what not to do. Um, what we could have had 40 years ago, uh, but a, a, a little summary of that. Um, next uh, section here, the stipulations of the covenant. 
What are the stipulations? What do we mean when we say that? Yeah, the requirements of the law. And so um, how does that serve God's people as they're doing covenant renewal under Joshua and about to go into the promised land? Why was that important for Moses to put here and to speak about? Yeah, uh, it, it, it showed them how they needed to act in order that they not, next section, yeah, in order that they not get the covenant curses. And so that whole huge section, the, the bulk of Deuteronomy from chapter 5 through chapter uh, 26 is to review how God wants them to behave toward each other and in worship um, so that he might just bless them, which, he, which is what he wants them to do. Um, he's brought them out of Egypt to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, and, and he wants them to be blessed. And so he repeats these things for them. Um, so they're, they're sure and they're confident of the way they need to behave and, and how they should worship. Okay, and then um, we, uh, he reviews the blessings and cursings with them, which he had given them in Leviticus chapter 26. Um, uh, he talks about, uh, I shouldn't put the last error up, we're still in 27.1. The ratification is he has the people uh, review this and say, yes, we'll do this. And so he gives, that, he gives that there, and they do that there on the edge of the promised land. But he also gives instruction there to do that when they get into the promised land um, around Shechem at Mount Ebal and, and Mount uh, uh, Gerizim. Um, and that they read back and forth the blessings and the curses, and they commit themselves. Once they get over into the promised land under Joshua, before they start fight, fighting and all that, they commit themselves to this and they review and they essentially say, if we don't do this, we agree the covenant curses. We have heard them and that is fair. That's the contract. And so they do that on one side of the Jordan with Moses there. And then they do that on the other side of the Jordan when they cross the Jordan with Joshua. Yeah, Matt. When we were reading the blessings and curses in our class, it was like one little section, like one little column of blessings. And it was like, all right, that sounds cool. Yeah. And the curses was like two pages. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But wait, oh, that sounds awful. But wait, yeah. there's more. Yes. It was, yeah. it was pretty serious stuff. Yeah. It's like we don't want that. Yeah. But we fall into it anyways. We're like, eh, mm -hmm. we'll taste of it. Yeah. Yeah, good. And then uh, the succession. So it's recorded that Moses in front of the people um, hands over um, the uh, leadership of Israel to Joshua. Why was that important for this original audience? To follow follow yeah, to follow Joshua. He was God's appointed leader and God's instrument um, to lead the people into the promised land. Now, so Joshua was God's instrument to lead God's people into the promised land. The name Joshua is the Hebrew name that gets translated into Greek as what? Jesus. Jesus. Does Jesus lead God's people into the promised land? Mm -hmm. Yes. Should we follow him? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So again, biblical theology, it's, it's repeated, repeated things. And so God shows us things and really he, he, he decrees real things to happen in the Old Testament that are showing forth who Jesus would be and what he would accomplish uh, in his coming to earth, dying, being resurrected, ascending on high, and all the way through until the new heavens and, and new earth. Okay. Um, Deuteronomy highlights. Um, let's see. Anna, can you read this first one for us? 6, 5, and 6. The greatest commandment, number one. Okay. Uh, what's the greatest commandment? Yeah, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. With all you are. That's the idea there. That's in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6. And so this is not a, 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 a bright intuition of Jesus. This is just Jesus answering the question correctly. Uh, what's the, the, the greatest commandment in the law? It's, it's from Deuteronomy 6, uh, 5 and 6. Um, so that's in Deuteronomy. We get this from Deuteronomy. <clears throat> Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. <clears throat> Love your neighbor as yourself comes from Leviticus. 
Um, all right, uh, next, Bob, can you read this bullet for us? Seven, uh, verses one through six, the Joshua mandate. Yeah, let's just take a look at this. Um, and so this is what we talked about um, in the uh, 3D on your pre-quiz there, and we hadn't looked at it before. Um, and so seven, one through six, um, when the Lord your God brings you into the land you're entering to possess, and drives out before you many nations, uh, which are uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Dun, 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 dun. There we go, seven nation army. Um, some of you know what that means, okay. Um, drives out before you many nations, the Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. What city did the Jebusites rule? Jerusalem, Jerusalem. yeah. Um, seven nations larger and stronger than you. And when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. Now read you a little footnote there. A, so you go down there. Um, uh, the Hebrew term refers, refers to the irrevocable giving over of things or persons to the Lord, often by totally destroying them, also in verse 26. Uh, this is the, it's the same word as the burnt offering, uh, what God's people do with a burnt offering. So it was an uh, 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 act of worship unto the Lord in obeying him in this way. Uh, going on, make no treaty with them and show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. And the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you covenant curses. This is what you're to do to them. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their Asher poles, and burn their idols in the fire. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. Okay, so that's the Joshua mandate. Um, just totally destroy all that is not um, aimed toward worshiping me. Now, what if a Canaanite says, I want to receive your God and be a worshiper of him? Right, you're in. Who's our great example of that? Rahab. 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 Yeah. And, and so this is not... <laughs> This is this is this is not a, a a racial thing. This is a religious thing. Uh, and so the Israelites, in coming and destroying the the or destroying the peoples of the promised land, they had Egyptians among them, who had done the same thing that Rahab had done. And so we see these sprinklings of this throughout um, uh, Exodus through Deuteronomy that Egyptians had come out with God's people because they were convinced by the ten plagues that the God of Israel was God and, and there was no other. And so they come out with God's people. So there's never a racial thing um, in scripture. It's always a religious thing um, there. Okay, also in Deuteronomy uh, 17, uh, 14 through 20 is, um, <laughs> uh, Betsy, can you read this? The command to have a king. Yes, the command to have a king. So just turn over to 17. And once you see as we talk about king a lot, and it could be because we just, because Jesus talked about king a lot. And Jesus said the gospel was the kingdom of God. And so we want to make clear that the kingdom was never God's B plan. Because in Deuteronomy 17, before they get into the promised land, from the mouth of Moses, before crossing over the Jordan River, God commands that they have a king. So if they don't have a king, What's their state? Disobedience or obedience? Disobedience. Yes. Without a king, they're being disobedient. Sounds like judges. Yeah. And so what do we see in judges? What's the repeated phrase? Every man did what was right in his own eyes. In, in those days, there was no king, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Yeah. In those days, there was no king in Israel. And it's always an explanation of why God's people were suffering oppression and chaos, and people were being killed. Um, it's because there was no king. Um, and, and so that's a, that's a word of rebuke that, that appears three to five times through judges. 
um, because they, they had not uh, selected a king. Um, so um, Deuteronomy 17, uh, 14 through 20, so looking at verse 14, when you enter the land the Lord your God has given you and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us, be sure to appoint over you the king the Lord your God chooses. Okay, so how do we sort out Saul and David from just what we've read there? Yeah, yeah. Saul was a king of the nations, a king like the other nations. And God describes him through Samuel. He's going to be, okay, you want a king like the nations? Okay, he's going to do this. He's going to tax you heavily. He's going to take your, your daughters for his own palace to bake him muffins. And he's going to take the best produce of your land. He's going to take your best sons for his army. You are going to oppress. And then you're going to cry out to me and say, relieve us from the oppression of this king, and I will not hear you. So their sin was not in asking for a king. That's what they were supposed to do. But when they asked for a king, who were they to appoint as king, according to Deuteronomy 17? The one that God chose. The one that God chose. And so fast forward into history, who did God choose? David. David, yeah. And so you see that there's a little distinction there as we're going through 1 Samuel that uh, Saul was your choice, but David was my choice. Um, and, and Samuel complains about this, and, and God says, fine, give them what they want, but tell, warn them, he's going to do this to you, and you're going to cry out to me from your oppression. And so the, the rest of 1 Samuel is showing what a terrible mistake it was to have, to have a king like the nations, and showing Saul over and over again, being unfaithful, and the people being oppressed, Philistines living in the land and pushing the Israelites around. Um, and even under Saul, it's David where Saul gets, you know, most of his victories. Yeah. I hesitate to ask, but I'll ask anyway. How long was uh, Saul king? So uh, 40 or 20 years. It, it, it depends there where you're, where you're looking, yeah. Okay, so the idea of Saul was your choice, David was my choice. Yeah. David wasn't alive when the initial choice was made, correct? Uh, he, he, uh, maybe, maybe not. We, we, it, it depends where we go with Saul's, uh, uh, the length of Saul's leadership. I was under yeah. the impression David was relatively young when yeah. he was appointed, right? Yeah, that's true. So then it was always part of the plan to okay. teach them a lesson, right? That this is what happens when you... Everything is always a part of the plan if you're talking about decree, um, right? Because whatsoever comes to pass is God's decree. But we, we know IHCs. Uh, we know potential futures and potential pasts, uh, which God knows. And so here's, here's the deal. Okay, put, get an IHC, get in providence mode. Okay, decree is what God has said, this will happen and I will make it happen. And once it happens, then you know what my decree was all along. Okay, but prior to that, you've got providence is where God works out his decree through the use of means, people, earthquakes, rain, landslides. Okay, the use of means, okay? And so if you're an Israelite coming out under Joshua, you conquer the promised land, what should you do according to Deuteronomy 20, or Deuteronomy 17, sorry, what should you do? What should you bring up to the attention of Joshua? We need a king. Need a king. And if they, if they had done that faithfully, what would God have done? Given them a king of his choice. Given them a king of his choice. Okay? Now, you just got to get your mind around that. Our minds are small, but I... I I promise you, if you think about this for 10 years, you'll just get it. And there, there's no conflict in this. But when you first start thinking about it, you kind of group providence and decree together. And then it gets confusing. But, but it's not. No, God, so potential past is that God gave his people because he commanded it. If he commands something and his people say, God, I want to obey you. We're ready for a king. Would God say, no, you have to go through 400 years and then select Saul because I want to curse you through Saul, a king of your own choosing? No. God, God delivers. Uh, but we find out as history unwraps itself 
that God's decree had been all that, right? Okay. I know it's a little hard to, uh, you know, to get that at first, but both things, so doctrines are boxes, and you keep your boxes full. You don't flatten one box. You don't flatten the providence box and become a hyper-Calvinist. And you don't flatten the decree box and become an Arminian. Okay? You keep both boxes big because God says, what's, you know, God, God says, I have decreed the earthquake and the disaster and the blessing and everything I've planned. Uh, but at the same time, he gives commands and he says, if you do this, I will do this. If you do that, I will do this other thing. And so that's the realm of providence. And we decide which we want. Um, and we don't know what the decree is until after it's done. Because everything that happens is something God has decreed.